there's um okay so the, this this session just to give you a little introduction um so this session is uh our, our keynote interview um and you know one of the things i've i've really liked about past facts is the way it sort of brings all of these different approaches to this common set of problems together including the the extraordinary role of journalism that journalism has played in documenting algorithmic harms but also in kind of um, explaining to folks outside of the industry how, how AI works and, and also in bringing the kind of research that is being done at FACT um, to a broader audience. Um, and in recent years, Karen has been, Karen Howe has been a fantastic proponent of this. Uh, and I've read kind of uh, rapidly every piece that she did at MIT Tech Review. Um, and I thought this was a wonderful opportunity to have her come and sort of talk to us about, uh, about that whole process. And so what the, what's going to happen now is we've got an interview between Karen and and William, uh, William Isaac, last year's um, general chair, researcher at DeepMind, um, who kindly agreed to do this and who has worked with Karen on various things. Um, so we'll have an interview with those two, which runs for about 35 minutes. And Karen has kindly agreed to join us live. Uh, she's in Hong Kong right now. Um, and after the video, we'll have a Q&A with the audience and with folks online. Um, so if I can get this to work properly, we will just start. Was it for a moment, guys? Sorry. There is an echo. It's weird because she's on the video and I thought I like, had to, you know, she was just on the other video. It really felt like I was having to say the same thing. OK, um, folks, can we mute the microphone in here by your system? Um, can you ask them that? This microphone off?
All right, Karen, you can come back. And Karen stepped away from the thing because she was too embarrassed to see her. <laughs> it was so weird to watch myself. Let me, how, how do I stop this chair? Okay, there it is. Okay, I pin you. And there you go. All right, so um, what we're going to do is the usual Q&A format. Um, we'll have questions in the, um, in the channel, on, in the Q&A channel on Hopin. Um, and then if folks could step up to the microphone um, and we can start going through the in-person questions also. By the way, Karen, did you see the, I tweeted you a picture of the crowd. So it's a, it, there's a big, big group of folks in here. Yeah, maybe the, uh, maybe the camera person um, could be asked to show Karen who all's here. Hi, Karen. Uh, my name is Jaha. I'm part of a startup called Parity. Uh, first of all, thank you for all the work that you do in reporting um, in, in this particular area. Uh, my question to you is about um, what, what is your experience on the ground as a journalist in terms of media amplification, uh, especially when it comes to like AI hype? Um, and I know that the work that you do is very much about um, making sure that the converse side of the story is told. Uh, but I was really curious about uh, what your perspective is as a practicing journalist about uh, journalism's responsibility to to moderate the excesses of hype, especially when it's um, you know uh, well intentioned and trying to contextualize something, but but possibly overstepping in terms of representation. Thank you. Yeah, that's a really good question. I mean, uh, in terms of the responsibility question, I think journalists have a huge responsibility to um, be a lot more critical and more realistic about what. AI technologies can do. I think kind of uh, embedded question I, I, I think I'm hearing from your question is also just like, how does it actually happen that we end up having um, so many articles that hype up AI? And I think there's sort of this dynamic where as AI becomes more and more prevalent everywhere, there are a lot more journalists who do not cover technology, do not cover AI at all, finding themselves suddenly called to cover these technologies, whether covering the crime bee and they have to suddenly cover facial recognition or whether they're covering the healthcare bee and they have to suddenly cover medical AI systems. Um, and they don't have, because of the way that the news cycle works and deadlines work, they don't necessarily have that much time to suddenly learn a new discipline. And so what happens is they end up just going to the loudest voices in the room as like the experts that they quote and oftentimes Unfortunately, as I'm sure everyone in the fact community knows, the loudest voices aren't always the people that um, are going to be the most critical or the most realistic about how these technologies work. And so I, mean, I, I think the thing that I would encourage everyone in the fact community to do is to put your voices out there and make sure that when journalists are looking for people to talk to, they, they're able to find you easily so that um, they ultimately don't gravitate to some of the other voices that um, might not necessarily give them like a healthy dose of skepticism. Amen to that, that's for sure. Um, next question from the in-person. Again, if you're, on, if you're online and you want to put a question in the Q&A, do go ahead and otherwise I'll just keep going with the Q in person. Hi, my name is Emily. Thanks for, so much for joining today. Uh, I really appreciate all of your work. And I wanted to follow up on kind of your point that um, AI research community might not be as familiar with, for example, what China has been working on in the AI ethics space. And I wanted to know if you had any recommendations for, I, I feel that that's true about myself as well. I feel a lot of the news I consume related to AI ethics as well as research publications are generally more um, uh, European and North American oriented. And so I was curious if you had recommendations from your own experience on, on how we as a community might better educate ourselves um, with China's the example you mentioned, but maybe beyond that as well. Yeah, it is honestly, it's a, it's a really good question and also a really hard one because um, sometimes, I, as I've started noticing now when covering China, like a lot of AI researchers in China are actually a little bit nervous right now to connect with people in the US or in other um, Western contexts because I think they're really tired of dealing with like stereotypes, they're wary of the US China rising tensions. Um, and so there is, it's definitely as much on like the lack of reach out from the West as it is from like the receding um, um, of researchers in China. But one of the things that um, in, in conversations in the past that I've had, international discussions in the past that I've had where it has been successful in bringing the Chinese perspective in, 
Um, it's usually like off the record conversations where everyone can just speak more freely and more safely about sort of the discussions that um, what's happening. Because the, the thing, I think the thing in the chi Chinese context is um, researchers are nervous about getting critiqued by the West, but they're also really nervous about um, saying something that might offend the Chinese government. And so giving them like that safe space to just speak freely without any concern of um, their words being put out in the public and generating backlash in one way or, or another is one way that I've, I've seen it be successful. Um, and also just Chinese researchers, a, a lot of them like publish in international conferences in English. So, um, and I, I mean, I think from a journalist, um, in, in terms of critiquing like AI coverage in journalism, I think one thing that like US based, UK based, European based journalists have not done very well is most of the time I and I did this too, like I would just gravitate towards papers that were being published from uh, Western institutions, but there's actually like so, so much um, literature and, and, and research be coming from Chinese institutions in English. So I, I guess I would just encourage people to read broadly what is already being published in these international spaces. Um, and yeah, build connections from there. Great, thanks. I will say we did, we did really want to try and make this, this fact an opportunity to connect with that community. Um, and, and COVID and the sort of the border restrictions made it incredibly yeah. hard. Um, so, you know, yeah. we, we tried with a couple of people like with Pascal Fung being a keynote, but, um, you know, it was, uh, it, it, it was really unfortunate that this happened at the same time as the borders just totally closing. Um, so I've got a question from um, the far side of the auditorium, distant, uh, the distant <laughs> mic who I didn't yeah. see before. So uh, please you go ahead and then we'll have the, the question from the q and from the uh, online chat. Okay, uh, so thank you for your work and for the talk here. It was great. And the thing we've been discussing a lot here is that there's no such thing as a view from nowhere. We're all biased in, in a way or another. So uh, I guess what I want to know is if you have any tips on how do you become aware of your own biases when you're writing, like the people you choose to interview, the bits of the story you choose to follow. Do you have any tips on how do you become aware of like your stance on a certain topic? Yeah, that's a good question. I, I So I think in journalism, there's, uh, I guess the best practice in journalism is, is you always try to interview someone that disagrees with you. Um, and so whenever I, I guess, I, especially with the journal, they take this very seriously. Like any, anytime you're going to write something uh, based on one person's argument, you have to try and find someone who would like totally disagree. Um, and you always try to write assuming that um, your worst critic is going to read the piece. So it's it's trying to do the mental gymnastics of, okay, what would that worst critic say? And, and how can I go talk to the, someone who represents that and also give like a proper airing of their disagreements in a piece. Um, but I, that said, I also, especially at, at um, Tech review when I was I was more covering like the scientific community. I, I don't really cover the scientific community anymore at the journal, but one of the things that I tried to do was also look at what the mainstream like who was being quoted in the mainstream outlets, and then how could I like find the other people <laughs> to um, give airing to their perspectives, and especially like who are the people. Uh, like oftentimes the people that are most quoted are, are the people that are more in power. So how do I quote the other perspective because they're going to have a totally different perspective on the issue. So um, yeah, I don't know if that answers your question, but it's, it really is just trying to find people that disagree with you and also being conscious of like the power dynamics that allows certain voices to rise over others and, and trying to um, do the opposite. Yes, yes, thank you. Okay, so we have a question from Ted Pedersen online. Um, a really nice one. Do you have any particular journalistic heroes or role models? Either people whose work you really like or who've been influential in some way? Oh my gosh. Um, Kari Johnson is holding down the fort at Wired and um, covering AI, the, the fact community's work and um, other issues. Um, Kashmir Hill at the New York Times has done some like really incredible investigative 
work on, on like she revealed that Clearview AI was a thing that exists. Um, yeah, there's so many, there's so many out there. And I, and what's really heartening is that I think it, 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 there are increasingly more role models these days that I look up to um, as journalists, specifically tech journalists, get more and more um, read up on like certain issues, certain technical topics, and and really like are fighting the good fight. That's great, thank you. Okay, the next question here from the first. Um... Um, hello. <clears throat> um, yeah, I think also going back to your point about. AI ethicists um, from China, et cetera. I think like, um, you know, with the nuance that AI is ultimately, you know, uh, paid attention to by like governments and nation states. Um, I'm curious, like, do you have any perspectives as a journalist covering China for mostly, I think, Western audiences? Like how can you sort of, you know, in this, in this like politicized climate, like give, um, do you have advice for not lapsing into this binary of like China versus the West and sort of uh, like, or like thoughts on complicating or countering dominant narratives in Western journalism and therefore like research around AI? This is a great question that I think about like every day, <laughs> like haunts me. Um, I don't have a good answer in that I'm still like, I'm still trying to figure this out myself, but one of my hypotheses thus far has been that I think a lot of the binaries come when we fo when we fixate on governments and institutions and what they're doing. And it's easier to subvert those binaries when you're talking about people and their lives, like individuals in their lives. Um, so I've personally been trying to just connect with more individuals um, who don't necessarily work at institutions or represent institutions or whatever it is just like people like whether it's an AI researcher that's just doing some interesting work or um, a person like a parent or or a student that is using some of these technologies um yeah but it's it's I mean it's it is really it's really tough and um it's particularly tough as a Chinese American journalist as well like I think there's there's um I have a lot of anxiety around like how do I tread this line in a way that doesn't um, make people also attack me? I it's sort of like the the way that I see Chinese American scientists um, or Chinese scientists that have like ties to the U.S. also like walking this really tight rope of like what can I do to try and subvert these narratives without being told that I'm a spy? <laughs> it's like a big question right now for um, people that that have a foot in both worlds. So um, yeah, it's, it's, an, it's an ongoing learning process for me and I, I would love to share more thoughts once I have a better better update. Cool. Okay, thank you. Okay, and um, I got a question coming up from the Q&A. Let me just quickly review it. Um, yeah, good one. Okay, so uh, this is a follow-up question to the point about um, the hype cycle. Um, so beyond making critical and informed voices accessible and visible, how can you better incentivize and encourage journalists and the media uh, to, for example, engage less with Lambda's supposed sentience and more with ML's real world abilities and impacts? So the sort of both the supply and the demand side there. Yeah, that's a, so it's, it's, it's <laughs> I, um, so it's been really interesting. So I, I, I wrote a piece that's sort of like making its way through edits and, and hopefully going to publish soon that was in response to this whole Lambda thing as a journal. And it's been really interesting. Um, this, this is the first time I'm writing about AI in the, at the journal rather than at Tech Review. Um, and the journal has like a much, as I sort of said in the video, like it is a much more broadly appealing audience and so it's been interesting to see like how the editors have tried to help me take things that are more academic and like connect it to what the public conversation is and unfortunately the public conversation like people just like talking about sentience but hopefully I think that we did a pretty good job of just like very briefly touching on that, but then like rerouting it entirely to um, just talking about the, the the 
critiquing the hype and where the source of the hype is from. Um, but it's, that's, yeah, it's sort of something that all media outlets, I think, grapple with is like, how much do you try to meet the public where they are versus teach the public something totally different from what they think. Um, it's sort of this delicate balance that needs to be walked. And I think that as fact researchers have become more and more, uh, like have put themselves out there more and more in talking about just issues like AI doesn't work, let alone is sentient. That has, uh, it's allowed journalists to be more aggressive about like pivoting the public conversation because again, like journalists can't, we can't just like randomly say like, no, it's not sentient. We have to reference, we have to reference the academic community. So the more that the academic community can like talk about problems, the more we can then be like, stop talking about this. Let's focus on what researchers are saying about the actual problems in AI. Thank you. Okay, next question from in the room. Yeah, we are talking a lot about uh, hype, you also used the word fake before. So my question is something like this. If there is, in this moment, a Theranos of AI going on, um, how hard will it be to actually discover it? It would be not hard at all if there were whistleblowers at this Theranos. <laughs> Um, yeah, and I think that, like, this is something that a, a ton of fact community members have talked about, that, like, we need better protections from the government to protect employees when they want to come forward when they're seeing something unethical happening within their companies. Um, and there needs to be a lot more conversations within companies to also have more diversity and empower that those diverse people in those companies so that when things are wrong, people have the space to speak up. Um, but ultimately, like, as journalists, we, like, I can't, I will never know what is happening behind closed doors unless someone breaks out of company line to tell me, right? So, like, that's ultimately, like, any investigative work that is done um, is very much reliant on people with strong moral compasses saying something's not right. Um, yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, so we're, we're very nearly at time. Um, so I would like to get through these last two questions. Um, but maybe what we'll do is we'll take the two questions together. And then Karen, you can have a last word. Okay, so. Okay, thank you, Karen. I'm Cynthia Lim from the Netherlands. Uh, and I've been one of these researchers who is trying to get more into the public media space to also speak about our work, especially in my case, algorithmic harms as well. But here, I've been struggling a bit and I see it in fellow academics too, uh, that if we go not with research journalism, but regular journalism, we do see that the media censor of what makes for a good message tends to favor, again, the less nuanced and loud stories. So often I get this criticism, you're being too nuanced, give me a one-liner. And that's something mm -hmm. I don't want to do in discussions like this. So my question would just be like, how can I counteract this? Is there a way? Yeah, that is a really big frustration. So we'll oh, take yeah, the two sorry, questions together. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Hi, Karen. Uh, thank you so much for your work on decolonial AI. It's been really, really interesting to read. Um, I work in AI ethics at DeepMind, and I think something that we really struggle with in, in the industry is just the dominance of like Western imperialist values underpinning AI ethics and just the way that we think about technology in general. I would love to hear from you about any AI ethics values that you've absorbed within the China AI space and whether you think there's anything that we can learn from the West, um, just because the conversation about Chinese AI and technology development is usually quite unnuanced in the West. Thank you. Okay, yeah. Karen, so last um, word so to you. The first, in terms of the first question, how to, how to combat this as a researcher, I think um, one of the things that I would recommend is to first try and pitch the, the journalists that you know have sort of Either they work at more technical publications that uh, just give them more space to get into the nuance, um, or you know that they have some kind of like um, more technical grounding in, in the kind of writing that they do. First start with those. And then once um, you have success with that, um, journalists also look 
to other like who's being quoted in other um upstream publications if you will like the mainstream publications like the bbc's wall street journals new york times like they will be looking at the more technical publications to see who's quoted what research is out there um and that can help kind of like predispose the the downstream stories from being more nuanced if they if, if the um earlier reporting help like teases out that nuance because for these publications that are more um are more mainstream the the journalists is they might not necessarily as i was saying they might not necessarily have the um, background to read the original paper themselves so they're also looking for other translations that have been done prior of like technical work um into lay terms so that i think that could be one one strategy um in terms of the, the second question, so one thing that um, I think one, yeah, this this is this is a really good question. Um, one thing I don't know how to like phrase this, so so bear with me as I like try to figure out how to say this right. The way that China, the Chinese government, has positioned itself. Uh, uh, particularly among developing countries um, is by sort of saying that they are, they are more attentive to the concerns that developing countries have. So like if a developing country wants to, um, you know, advance their country, reduce poverty in their country, all of those things, like they should follow the Chinese model because China knows how, um to navigate this world and what i think we can learn from that is the fact that for a lot of um, the global south this has been a very compelling message and so that tells us that the us and like the west in general has been very unattentive to the fact that developing countries do have different concerns from developed countries and especially when it comes to te technology development what are the actual like ethics concerns that um, people in the global south want to be talking about. And so from that perspective, I think like, yeah, like the, the it's like, I, I sometimes when I talk to researchers in, in the global south context, they mention things like, um, for example, actually with like the data labeling conversation, um, I had a really interesting conversation with a researcher who was like, you know, every time people talk about like ghost work as though this labor is hidden, that is automatically like a Western perspective because in the global South, it is absolutely not hidden. Everyone knows someone who's doing this kind of work. Um, and so being attentive to like that frame of reference and how just in developed countries in a developed context, um, there is going to be a totally different frame of reference. They're going to be caring about totally different things. Um, yeah, I don't, this is like a jumble of thoughts, but I think that's sort of ultimately how we can try to break away from some of the more, as you put it, like imperialist perspectives that are that are part of the AI ethics discussions in um, the West today. All right, everybody. Um, so let's. Um, so I, I want to thank two people here. So one, um, I want to thank um, William Isaac, who is hopefully tucked up in bed in the UK. Um, it's the middle of the night there. So thank William for for doing the interview, and then to thank Karen for uh, just a really insightful interview and and Q and A after. Thank you so much for having me. Thanks so much, Karen. All right, lunch. <laughs>